So in this series of lectures, we're going to talk about fluids. Now, fluids are a collection of states of matter that are different than solid because the atoms in a fluid material can move by one another and are not rigidly bound like they are in solid. And this gives fluids a unique property, they can flow. Their shape can change as you move them from one container to another. Now, good examples of fluids that we encounter in everyday life are in fact the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. Now, water is a liquid and air is a gas, but they are both examples of fluids. If you actually take a gas like air and you heat it up, eventually the collisions between the molecules get enough energy that they'll knock electrons off the atoms. And when that happens, you convert the gas into a plasma. And a plasma is another example of a fluid state. And you find this in flames, and in fact, the biggest example being the sun is a ball of plasma that's gravitationally bound. However, it doesn't stop there. If you take a plasma and you heat it up even more, eventually the collisions between the atomic nuclei are going to get sufficiently energetic that these nuclei will melt and you'll get a ball of what's called a quark gluon plasma, which is formed from the melted atomic nuclei and consists of quarks and gluons. And this has only recently been created in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and we're still studying the properties of this unique state that filled the entire universe less than a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. So obviously, fluids have got very different properties to those of solids. And so we're going to need to develop some new physical quantities that we can use to describe how these materials behave. Now with solids, one of the properties we typically concern ourselves with is the mass of the solid. But for fluids, this is not going to be a useful property. If I have a container here and it's filled with a particular fluid here, I can easily uh, split this container up into two smaller containers and pour the fluid into these such that I have the same fluid but now split into two smaller containers and the mass in each container now is going to be different um, and in fact I could even change how I divide the fluid up but clearly I still got the same fluid so if I use the property of mass that's not going to be particularly useful when describing fluids um, because even though I've got the same fluid here the amount of mass is variable and I can choose how much mass there is whereas if I have a solid object you know I have to break the solid uh, object in order to affect its mass so mass is not going to be useful for fluids instead what we do is we define a quantity called density which is defined as the mass per unit volume. So it's the mass of fluid divided by the volume of fluid. And so here you have the units are going to be kilograms for mass, those are the SI units, and volume we measure, of course, in cubic meters. And so we have units of kilograms per cubic meter for density. Now this is going to be a lot more useful for describing fluids because the density of a fluid is going to be common under the same conditions. Both of these samples of fluid would have the same density um, and so I can calculate the mass simply by taking the volume of fluid that I have and multiplying it by the density of the fluid. Now another common unit for density uh, used a lot particularly by chemists is grams per cubic centimeter. So how do we convert uh, kilograms per cubic meter into grams per cubic centimeter? Well, if we start with kilogram per cubic meter here, well, a kilogram is equal to a thousand grams, and a cubic meter is equal to, what well, if I draw the cube here, so here's my, oops, not a very good artist. Here's my uh, uh, cubic meter, and I've got 100 centimeters on each side. So these are centimeters. And so therefore, I have um, 100 times 100 times 100, which is 10 to the power 6, or a million uh, cubic centimeters. 
And so this is equal to 10 to the minus 3 grams per cubic centimeter. So 1 kilogram per cubic meter is equal to 10 to the minus 3 or 1,000th of a gram per cubic centimeter. Now, another property of moving fluids that we've in fact already introduced briefly when we were talking about elasticity is pressure. And we talked about this in the, co in the context of bulk, stress, and strain, where we put an object at the bottom, uh, immersed it in a liquid, and the object was compressed from all sides by a bulk stress. And that derived from the pressure of the fluid. So let's discuss this in a bit more detail using the computer. Okay, now the other flip side when you're dealing with mechanical properties of materials is we've talked about mass and we use density when we're dealing with fluids. The other property, of course, we're interested in with mechanics is force. Now, a force doesn't really make much sense with a fluid. If you try and apply a force to a fluid, if you just you know, poke your finger into the fluid to apply a force, nothing happens you, other than you get a wet finger. You haven't really applied a force to a fluid. What you have to do is you have to apply a force over an area. And if you immerse something into a fluid, the fluid itself will actually exert a force on that object, and the larger the area of the object is the larger the force it will feel. And so rather than force to deal with in fluids, we define a quantity called pressure, and that is equal to the force perpendicular to an area divided by the area itself. And so if we look at the units, then we have force measured in newtons and area measured in meters squared, and so we have units of newtons per square meter, or if you like them, pascals. Now, this should be ringing some bells because, of course, we've seen these units before when we were dealing in elasticity with stress. We had a force per unit area, and we even dealt with pressure in fluids in a very glancing fashion when we talked about our bulk stress. And if you remember, this was a force that was exerted on the sides of uh, an element of uh, material. So in this case, we'll just draw a cube. right? And if you remember, we had the force acting in all directions at the same time. And the example we gave of how this would work, um, or how you could do this, would be to immerse an object in a fluid. And the stress, this bulk stress that this object would feel, is in fact equal to the pressure of the fluid that surrounds it. Now, the interesting thing about pressure is if we look here at these two examples at the bottom of the screen, the pressure does not have a direction. So here I have two uh, um, planes here. One is vertical and the other horizontal, but I could have any uh, orientation I like, and they have the same pressure. Both of these feel the same pressure. And so what this means is that pressure is un not like force. Force is a vector quantity. Pressure is a scalar quantity. So it is, does not have a direction. Any area immersed at the same point in a fluid will see, feel the same pressure regardless of the orientation of that area. So it will not have a direction. It's a scalar quantity. Now, the other thing we do with pressure is that uh, if you look at these quantities here, we've defined our pressure as delta F divided by delta A. And so, of course, we take the limits, and this goes to df by dA. So we can define it in a differential form. The reason for this is, is that the pressure may vary 
at a different point in the fluid. So the pressure at a particular point in the fluid is the same and doesn't have a di preferred direction. It's a scalar quantity. But if I go to a different point in the fluid, say here, then that can have a different pressure. I could have a P prime here and a pressure P here. So in order to measure the pressure, in order to define the pressure in a, in a standard way, we have to use differential areas because the pressure over this whole area here, if it's a macroscopic area, may not be constant. But the pressure at a point is a single value and it's a single scalar value. Now we've seen how pressure acts in all directions and so that's why pressure is a scalar quantity because it has no direction associated with it. So what that means is if you have an object in uh, a liquid um, or gas, uh, the pressure will crush in all directions. And so to show that, what we've got here is a metal can, and what we're going to do is we're going to remove the air from inside the can. When we do that, what will happen is the pressure on the outside atmosphere will act unopposed. At the moment, the pressure inside the can is pushing out just as much as the pressure outside the can is pushing in. And what you will see is the can will collapse in all directions. Now, since it's not a circular can, there will be asymmetries. But what you should see is both sides of the can will collapse in because pressure acts in all directions. And this is the Earth's atmospheric pressure, which is 100,000 newtons per square meter, or slightly less at Edmonton's altitude. And so the pressure that this will generate, the force that this will generate on the side of the can like this, will be quite substantial and easily enough to collapse the can. So here we go. I just have to hook it up to the vacuum. Oops. Get that in there, and then switch it on. And there we go. You can see that this can has been crushed in all directions. There is no preferred direction at all. The pressure acts in all directions and has crushed the can for us. So that's the end of this lecture on pressure and density.